Father God in heaven, thank you for coming into the world and dying the death that you didn't want us to die. May we always approach your throne humbly and with meek and gentle hearts, filled with gratitude with the message of the cross. All things revolve around your cross. Thank you for the blessing of your word, scripture. Without it, we would be mindlessly roaming around like sheep, confused. Let the word proclaim be amplified with all who are here. And may your mighty name thunder because of it. In Jesus' great name, I pray all of this. Amen. So Paul is an expert in cramming a ton of richness in a very small space. Every page, every verse, every word is packed full with theological awesomeness. Paul's letter to the Colossians has now slightly shifted from teaching them how they are to behave toward one another to having a more in-depth look at how we are to behave toward one another in a family system. So this is when we start to see specific connections and specific relations that Paul will address. Let's get into the text now. We're in Colossians chapter 3, verses um, 18 to chapter, onward to chapter 4, verse 6. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye services as people pleasers, but sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you have, you have a master in heaven. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. As human beings, we all desire human connection, which builds what we experience as relationships. In the Oxford Dictionary, the word relationship is defined as the way in which two or more concepts, objects, or people are connected or the state of being connected. We need to be mindful of the connections we have with people. They are so vitally important because they truly can shape who we are. God, in writing through Paul, runs, through a, runs us through a gauntlet of different kinds of connections and relationships. We, re, we read through them moments ago. There is a, a lot going on in these texts. So let's start where Scripture starts, at the very heart of the family, which is the marriage. Verse 18, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. This is everyone's favorite verse in the Bible, right? <laughs> That's a powerful statement right there. It's also a very abused statement as well. And we are going to spend the majority of our time here. I just felt the Spirit leading me in this area while studying and writing through these verses. In order for us to understand this verse and all its complexities, we have got to understand everything from the first verse of this, of this chapter. We cannot understand verse 18 without firstly understanding verses 1 to 17. When we truly understand that we need to be seeking and setting our minds on heavenly things from above, where Christ is seated, when we understand that Christ is our life, when we understand that we have to put off all of our passions and desires that can dominate our hearts and let the peace of Jesus rule our hearts, when we understand what we are putting on, then we can start to unpack what it may mean for a wife to submit to a husband. First and foremost, submission is done toward each other out of reverence for Jesus Christ. So when we submit to each other as believers, we submit to Christ himself. 
Which is why biblical true submission is so vital for the church and vital for relationships. God lays the foundation for what submission looks like for a husband and for a wife who are bound in marriage. Any doctrine on submission or obedience within the family system, whether it's the submissive, submissiveness of a wife or the obedience of a child, needs to be completely grounded and soaked in the personhood of Christ. The problem becomes when we remove Jesus as the all-encompassing factor for interpreting this doctrine. This is when people tend to view the role of the wife being submissive to their husband as barbaric, outdated, and morally wrong. And that is all true when the doctrine is based on tradition or the personhood of the man and not grounded in the personhood of Christ. Oftentimes the word submission is plucked out of the Bible and interpreted from the lens of human experience and emotion. So we are going to unravel this together. And here's a simple principle I think will help. As Christians, we submit to each other because of the power of Jesus, which is displayed in each one of us. That is why in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, believers are asked to submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. If I submit to you, and yes, pastors of all people, should be at the forefront of what it looks like to submit as we set the example if Christ is displayed in you, I must submit out of reverence for Jesus Christ. Through Christ who is in me, I am able to submit to you who has Christ in you. So the first principle of submission is the presence, the love, and the power of Christ must be displayed. And that is ground zero when it comes to building a, thio a, theology, a theology or doctrine or understanding on literally anything. All things hinge on the power of Christ in us. In 1 Corinthians, it says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. We know where this power comes from. It comes from Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 5, at the end of verse 18, Paul instructs them on what Christian behavior should look like. I think it gives us a clue on what submission should look like. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul echoes this statement in chapter 3 of Colossians. Just before he calls all wives to submit to their husbands. Making submission an outward declaration and expression of Christ's power within a Christian. By being so filled with the Holy Spirit that a Christian believer recognizes this within another Christian and acknowledges it by submitting to it. More often than not, we put the main focus on the personhood of the individual who is being asked to submit. All fingers get pointed toward wives and children, telling them they must submit and they must obey. That is not an accurate way of approaching this. All attention should be placed on the one whose submission is toward, in this case, the husband. And why is that? Well, Ephesians chapter 5, and in verses 22 to 24, are important for us at this point. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their husbands. The husband is being compared to Christ as the head of the church. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a very important comparison to me. It's kind of a big deal. The husband is the head of the family. What does that mean? As Christ died for his church, so too the husband should be willing to die for his family and his children, not just giving of his life by dying to the desires of his flesh as well. Self-sacrifice must be present in anyone who leads or is at the head. The head of a wife. The head of children the head of a congregation, all need to have self-sacrifice at their core. And wives, you know, you will know if your husband is being self-sacrificial. It will become evident. You'll feel it in your spirit. You'll know. Chapter 5, verses 22 to 27 of Ephesians says, and it sets up the command for husbands to be Christ-like and love their wives. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So the question to ask is, to whom am I submitting to? The answer is, to a husband who loves you so much and displays the love of Christ within him so much that there is an inward desire for the wife to submit. Wives are not called to submission 
mindlessly or blindly. If a woman submits to her husband who is not displaying Christ's likeness, then what is she submitting to? She would then be submitting to bone and flesh and desires of her husband's human will, which are corruptible. She would be submitting to her husband's human authority, simply just because he is a man. But is that what the text says? No. That will be the worldly definition of submission, which has perverted the definition of biblical submission. Paul is telling both husbands and wives to be like Jesus. For wives to yield to Jesus' love within their husbands. And for husbands to display the power of Jesus in sacrificial love toward their wives. The worldly definition of submission is the act, the action, or fact of accepting or yielding to a superior force or to the will or authority of another person. The biblical definition of submission, summarized, is willfully giving up oneself in service to their partner. There are a few key things that are different. The biggest issue with the world's definition is that it literally says you are submitting to the will, authority, and superiority of a person, the husband. This is next level incorrect. Husbands are not superior to their wives, period. Secondly, notice the word willfully in the biblical definition. Wives are called to submit out of their own will, their own free will, not out of force, in service, out of reverence for Jesus. Now, with husbands, we are called to love our wives. Seems pretty self-explanatory, right? However, we have to remember that this is not the world's definition of love, which is how we feel. The biblical definition of love is self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice is defined as the giving up of one's own interests or wishes, in order to help others to advance a cause. We can clearly see that God's design for marriage is a mutual, self-sacrificial union of equality and love. First of all, God holds men to a certain standard which they must adhere to. Then wives are submitting to the love displayed through the Holy Spirit. As he empowers the husband to display the full love of Christ toward his wife. There's nothing outside of that which wives are called to submit to. So to the men out there, we can't sit back and think we can ride on easy street as the big boss man of the home. Simply because we happen to be born male. Being male does not qualify anyone. A husband's ability to submit to Christ does. If a husband expects his wife to submit to him without first submitting himself to Christ, then what the husband is saying is that based on his own authority and merit, simply because he is a man, he is deserving of being submitted to. That is not biblical. Wives are not called to submit to their husbands simply because of their gender. Adam got it wrong in the garden. If Adam were to follow the biblical parameters we have now, and that we can see, and the teaching we have now, to embody the love of Christ toward his life as her husband, to desire for Eve's well-being and protection, he would have taken complete responsibility for eating the fruit and begged God to spare Eve and her female descendants of all punishment. His wish and plea would have been that all of the responsibility falls on him, sacrificing himself for her. But that's not what happened. Moral of the story, some men have been missing the point since the beginning of humankind. We all fall short, and we all not need Jesus. That's the point. To link this with the previous verses of Colossians in chapter 3, for the husband, this is putting on love. This is the display of Christ in the husband. And what we need to understand is that the Christ which is displayed is clearly laid out as the sacrificial Lamb of God. It's the authority of the Lamb of God that men are to display. And this is where many have gotten it wrong. Many men want to be the king on the throne, not the sacrificial lamb. They want to have the authority of the king on the throne. But husbands, we are not called to be a king on a throne. We are called to display, to highlight, and point to the lamb on the cross. We are not the king, and we are not on the throne. We are to display it, not to be it, to display it. You remember older sitcoms on television back in the 70s and 80s, I suppose. You'd see, the, you'd see the husband at the head of the table, and he'd have the biggest piece of meat. And the philosophy behind that is that he deserved to have the biggest piece of meat 
because he was the king of the castle. He's the dad, he's the, he's the father. But that's a me first mentality and couldn't be further from the way a Christian dad as the head of a Christian family is called to operate. For a father to display the power of Christ within him, the biggest piece of meat should be divided and distributed out toward those whom he loves. It becomes a them first mentality. That is the husband dis displaying Jesus as the, as the lamb and not sitting on the throne at the table as any sort of king. Look at Ephesians uh, chapter 5 and verse 23 again. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. And there it is. The Christ as head is the Christ that dies for his church as its savior. And is the very same Christ that the husband is compared to as the head of his wife. And this can be really hard to wrap your head around for some, but it's so, so important to understand because marriage is important. Women are often so treated like a commodity on too large of a scale for far, far too long. And I've seen firsthand what damage that can do. That's probably why my spirit is on fire about this particular one verse. With the proper view of marriage, children get to see how a woman is to be treated and loved. Jesus has a beautiful look. He was a beautiful example of that. But he's not physically here. He's within us, but he's to be displayed within all of us. So husbands, he is telling us to be that example in our marriages now. If it sounds like I'm being hard on men within the family system, that may be because I do hold Christian men to a higher degree of responsibility, as I believe God does. That's part of the role. He has placed a great deal of responsibility on men as head of the home. Not because he values men as superior or greater, but simply because this is his design for men and women in marriage. And a lot of men are happy to take the authority of leadership, but neglect the responsibility they gain with it. But if men are held responsible for their families, it only calls to reason. God would place them at the head. It wouldn't make sense for the husband to be held accountable to a higher standard if his wife is leading the family. Like Adam was held to a higher standard in the garden. Adam had everything he needed in the garden because he was in the presence of God. But he still failed Eve. Now Christian men, as husbands, have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within them and have the responsibility of being Christ-like as head of the family system. I don't say this to make anyone feel bad, or guilt, or shame anyone, but these verses clearly set the standard and the goal for what we are to strive to and to achieve, myself included. We are all on a journey of growth. We can see the goal, we can see the standard, we know the assignment. So man, we can't let that assignment crush us. We can't let what God created us to be actually be the reason why we fail. Adam was created to lead, and he tried to blame God for sending Eve to him as the reason why he failed. That's so unbelievably foolish. If only we had someone in our corner to help us achieve the goal. If only God sent us a helpmate to love us and encourage us with nurturing, gentle ways, who could be a soft place for us to land as we bear the weight of responsibility that is placed on our shoulders. And we know he did. God made woman a precious gift, something so precious that God instructs husbands to love them so much that they would lay down their lives for her. And for all women in the room today, whatever lies this world or Satan has told you about your worth and value, throw them out the window right now. Remove them. You are so valuable to God. That he died for you, as he did for all of us. But in addition to that, God tells husbands to love you in such a sacrificial way that they are to lay down their lives for you and die to themselves as well. Both husbands and wives are called to die to self in service to one another, in each their own way. God's design for us is perfect. So husbands, build on what you have and where you're at today. See the journey along the way as a blessing. I sound like a, har a Hallmark commercial. It's not about the destination, it's about the journey. It actually is about the destination. Finish strong. Start where you're at, and be thankful for the growth and spirit that you have already achieved. Make an inward declaration right now, just do it right now, to be a Christ-like husband. 
Don't matter where you were, it matters where you're at right now. Make the declaration. And if you are already achieving that, then that is fantastic. There are a lot of ways to display Christ-like leadership. There is something beautiful about a husband who displays all the, vir the virtues from God we went to, we went through last week. Gentleness of spirit, kindness, patience, meekness, love. And wives, you have a huge responsibility too. To be receptive to and encourage the inner work of the spirit which is being displayed within your husband. To nurture that. And to submit to it. Is what the text says. That is an important responsibility. One that I think gets overlooked and undervalued. Dying a self-sacrificial death as Christ died. Cannot die the same death Christ died on the cross, but we're called to die to self, empty ourselves out. That's God's design. He's telling both women and men to sacrifice self with Jesus as our ultimate example. I think it's just so important for us to truly understand what God is asking of us here. What may be even more challenging as we learn the truth is to unlearn the incorrect theologies the world has told us and sold us for so long about what God's perfect design for marriage really is. And a good way to test ourselves, men, is ask ourselves, if the roles were reversed, would I be willing to submit to my wife as head of the family if that is what God called me to? If your answer was no because you felt or you were, you've said no because you thought you were going to be perceived as lesser or weak, you may have an incorrect uh, knowing of what submission really is. And also, that is a trick question because God does call us to submit as well. It's just that many times people stop at verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands. Okay, shut her down. Say no more, I got it. <laughs> but God's like, not so fast. Another question to test ourselves. If submission is for the weak and those who are inferior, then why did Jesus submit to the will of the Father? Was Jesus weak? Is Jesus inferior? Absolutely not. And this submissive theology trips up so many people, and those who do apologetics, which is defending the faith, what I see over and over again is that the attack comes on, why was Jesus uh, lesser than the Father? He clearly is, Clearly is, but where they trip up is he emptied himself. He, it's, he showed us how to do it. And people try to see that as you can clearly see Jesus is lesser than. And he did that out of his own free will. So we see the standard. We need to toss the idea that submission is for those who are weaker or inferior. Right out the window. God designed marriage to be awesome. Not to be a burden, or to put men above women, not to cause either men or women hardship, but to see them both flourish. There's no hardships. There's not supposed to be hardships in marriage. It's hard, but you've heard the old saying, the old ball and chain. There's no ball and there's no chain. There's not supposed to be. There should be no oppression within a Christian marriage. No suppression and no inequality. By creating Eve from Adam's rib, God was highlighting equality. The point I want to illustrate is that we are all equally in the same boat as Adam, dead. Read through Romans, you'll, you'll see that. The point I want to illustrate is that we all are dead. But it's through Jesus and his death on the cross why we are alive. And that gets applied to all equally who believe. No matter your gender, no matter your skin color, no matter your financial status, no matter your position within society, there is equal equality within the body of Christ. And although we are equal, we do function differently. And that's not a new revelation, I know. I'm not expounding some great thing you never heard before. Oh my goodness, did you hear men and women are different? What a revelation. Let me give you something to consider. What if God's design, what if he designed the function of men and women in marriage this way? Because we each lack the exact character traits he knows we need to learn. In order to be refined, as Isaiah in chapter 48 says, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. Much like the word submission, the word affliction is often seen as a bad thing. Who really enjoys being afflicted? But the Bible teaches us that God uses affliction to help us grow. So hear me out. What if God's design for men to lead and women to submit is the very thing he knows we need to grow? 
It's not always easy to be self-sacrificial, is it? It's actually quite hard for us, sometimes. And it's not always easy to submit. If marriage was easy, would we grow? No. If life was easy, also, would we grow? No. Men typically tend to be straight, linear thinkers, forward moving. We get a bad rap for being simple minded. And technically, we kind, of, kind of are. We think simply because men use the right hemisphere of our brain more the majority of the time. Females use both hemispheres, it goes back and forth. This isn't looking good for us. <laughs> if you do this. this is why females can multitask more often doing a bajillion things at the same time. The left hemisphere says to the right hemisphere, let's do this and we're off to the races, let's go. Women can juggle work, home life, five kids, chores, errands, while talking on the phone and ordering a pizza. I would struggle to order the pizza. <laughs> Typically they can talk circles around men. Most of the time we don't even know what, where our kids even are. <laughs> How many men do you know who would be happy to let their wives make all the decisions, do all the work, and take care of everything. That's not to say that men don't make awesome leaders. They really do. But think about it. God wants to refine us, to challenge us, to teach us, to sacrifice our own ways, our own desires, for the growth and betterment of the other. And just as an example, he tells men to be gentle, yet women have many gentle, nurturing qualities. He tells women to submit, yet many women have strong opinions and brilliant ways of managing things. But by men growing their gentle, nurturing qualities, they're becoming more well-rounded, more Christ-like. By women submitting to their husbands, they are learning perhaps to step back and allow someone else to lead the way. And I can imagine that would be very hard if you're that competent in your mind to step back and say, you take the reins here. It's just a theory. Whatever God's reasons, we should always look to Jesus when we need any example and how Jesus treated women in the Bible with the utmost love and respect. I want to acknowledge those wives who may find this teaching very difficult. Being told to be submissive can be challenging to follow, especially with our culture defining for us what submissiveness is. It's seen as being dominated over and controlled it is a very difficult teaching, and as husbands and men, we have to be kind and gentle and patient and loving toward anyone who struggles with it. Marriage is meant to be a light to the world. Marriage is a covenant created by God so that males and females would be connected physically as one, to be able to defend themselves against lustful temptations when one or another is not in control. But also, God created marriage to protect us from loneliness and to strengthen us in power like a three-chord strand. In Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, as it speaks to the marriage union and the importance of two, and then three. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. How amazing is it when the husband and wife toil and work toward growing the kingdom, it's beautiful. Working in ministry together, lifting each other up, encouraging one another, amplifying what's been gifted to the other as a spiritual gift, stewarding the blessings and monetary wealth well, to be one, unified, and witnessing to the world, all within the constructs of a marriage well lived, cared for, protected, and loved. A marriage that has fractures or disunity within it, it's not a good witness to the world. Because there is togetherness and oneness and unity within Christ. It's the devil who targets marriages. He, target, he targeted the first marriage and he hasn't stopped since. And he won't stop. The devil knows God created the covenant of marriage to be an example of Jesus as king, unified, as one with his church. And the devil doesn't want any representation of that on the earth. When the marriage operates like a threefold cord, its focus becomes toward heaven and magnifies the witness of God here on earth, which is a beautiful thing. Ecclesiastes continues, But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? 
So the next time your wife puts her cold feet on you in bed, before you get shocked half to death and start to get angry, you go to this text. Remember, verse 11, Ecclesiastes. If two lie together, they keep warm. Husbands, you're a walking, warming, heating blanket. But also let the warmth that you provide each other be also not just physical, but spiritual warmth. As you lift each other up in the spirit, the husband can also act as a spiritual heating blanket. There's so much strength in that which we can tap into. Because in verse 12, And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not easily broken. That is saying you may prevail alone, but two will withstand. That's powerful. Husbands and wives, as one unit, are stronger to face all of life's troubles. We can also look at marriage like a fortress. There is no human relation or connection more important than the husband and the wife. And as we see in verse 12 of Ecclesiastes, it's protective in nature as well. When enemy forces seek to take you down, either spiritual forces or physical forces that may be attacking your family or your marriage directly, it's the fortification of your marriage as a fortress which can protect you. And how does the Bible say that marriage is fortified? By the strength of the three strands in the marriage. And the third strand, as we know to be, is God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Use any of the three. Yahweh, El Shaddai, El Roy, Elohim, whatever you say his name, it's God. The next verse says in Colossians, bouncing back, taking you on a journey here in my mind. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. A great text for parents. You put that one on the wall. <laughs> I want us to take notice here that Paul uses the word obedience when referring and referencing children but not husbands and wives. The word submission has incorrectly been interchanged with obedience, but the two are not the same. There is submissiveness that children must display, display toward their parents, as we're supposed to as Christians, back and forth. Learning submission as children is important as we grow in Christ. Learning to submit all things to Jesus. This will strengthen our abilities in our adult relationships as well. However, children are called to obey their parents. You may want to throw it out there and your children are misbehaving next and just point them straight to Colossians. Obey me in everything. Look at the next verse though. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. My goodness, I love the Bible. Yet again, we see more evidence from Scripture showing the responsibility of the husband and father as head of the family. It doesn't say mothers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. It's fathers, placing the burden of responsibility for spiritual health of the family more predominantly on the husband. Everyone plays their role. Everyone is responsible for their part. But the burden of responsibility falls on the husband. Kids will drive you nuts. They will test your boundaries. I see some of you pointing to your children and love it. You. And we're not allowed to leave them at the grandparents as much as you might want to. You can't permanently leave them at your grandparents. As much as you want to. Just a few more weeks. Who's going to know this? Do you remember the movie Braveheart when it came out? And do you remember the famous speech that Mel Gibson delivered as William Wallace? It was. It, 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 part of, it became part of pop culture at the time. He gave a speech and at the end he said, they'll never take our freedom. And he yelled at it. And when I saw that for the first time, the 14-year-old me just screamed out, yeah, they'll never take our freedom. They'll never. And then I went to my parents. Yeah, you're never going to take my freedom, mom and dad. I say this to point out that kids are impressionable. Much of Paul's letters and epistles have to do with living a Christian life. And in many sections, Paul talks about the family system. The family system as it pertains to the church body, but also as it pertains to the home. Children are influenced in four ways, scientifically. First, 70% of children are influenced by their parents. And then the next three, the next 30% are divided. 
in no particular order. 30% by mentors, like teachers, their peers, like their friends, and the internet and social media. As a child ages, the percentages actually shift so that the parental influence decreases and mentors, peers, and cultural influences, they start to increase. So that in their later years, it's predominantly mentors, peers, and culture with now have the influence over them. This tells us, though, just how important the parental oppression is when children are young. As a foundation is built, it also tells us something else. That as a child grows into a teenager, they will then influence other teenagers in a massive way. Making being, building up children in the faith absolutely vital to a sustained Christian witness within a society. What's also important to know is that children are influenced by their parents' actions as much as what the words their parents use to guide them. I don't know how many times I've heard my father say, do what I do, do what I say, not as I do. I'm like, well, you're doing something completely different than you're saying. Teach a child that Christ dwells in their heart and you can change their life. Show a child that Christ dwells in yours and you can change a generation to go into the world and make disciples. Their first needs to be disciples. We need people constantly being fed with life and then not only sustained, but nourished. Nourished to maturity in the spirit so that they will in turn teach. Without teachers, there are no students, which means there are no disciples. We must grow and learn and teach with the Holy Spirit as our headmaster. It's when we realize we need an outside force greater than ourselves guiding us, protecting us, and showing us the way. I'm going to invite Zach up, and I'm just going to close up here now. Jeez. What we can teach others is to break free from the prison of the self and help them understanding the depravity of all of our nature as a gift. It's standing in the mirror and seeing the darkness that exists in us, separate from God. That will magnify the light that is within you by God. The light of grace that illuminates who we are in Jesus. And now all of that can only be done through the Spirit, by the eyes of the heart which is illuminated, Ephesians chapter 1. Have you ever been so overwhelmed at the realization of how much Jesus loves you to the point where you just broke down in tears? When the soul which was created to love God and be loved by God in perfect relation and in perfect connection with God understands that fact. As the soul understands in his or her heart that he or she will return to that love in fullness to bask in the glory of the Lord for eternity. If we can truly see that, then our own pride and flesh can die under the weight of it. As husbands, we can lose the ego and shut down the lies that we are somehow superior to women. And wives can silence the voice that says, I will submit to no one. Both of those mindsets are engulfed in our pride. This verse 23 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. This verse hammers home the point. As we do ministry and life together, both in the church and within marriage, that we work heartily for the Lord only and no one else. It's always for the Lord. With everything we've got, our marriages are to honor the Lord with everything we've got. And our churches are to honor the Lord and both are to serve as light and a witness to all. With our eyes on Jesus at all times for all things. And then verse 25. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. There is no partiality within the body. All have fallen in sin equally. All have been raised equally through faith. We have complete equality within the body of Jesus. Let us not abuse or distort this equality for our own gain. Let's make much of Jesus how we can, when we can, as much as we can, because he is deserving of it and much more. Heavenly Father, as we leave today, I just want to thank you so much for your son. I want to thank you so much for your church. I want to thank you for the covenant of marriage. 
binding us together with a partner in life that we can do life with. I just thank you so much for our members of our congregation. I want to pray a blessing over them now as we go out into the world and be a light. I just want to pray that uh, you'll be strengthened in spirit. Your marriages will be strengthened in spirit and that you'd have the love of Jesus in your heart for each other. In Jesus' great name I pray this. Amen.